Good morning, friends. Y'all sound so good in this thing, I hate to break you up. <laughs> Grace and peace to all of you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And welcome home this morning to Centenary United Methodist Church. Especially want to welcome any visitors we have in our midst and all those who are worshiping with us online this morning or in the days to come on our uh, website and Facebook page and YouTube. Have several announcements to lift up this morning. And Paul's on standby to do one, I believe. Sure. Yeah. Just mm -hmm. give you a little heads up. I'm going to give you a, a, little, a, little, a little warning before I have to tell Um First thing you'll see in the bulletin, there is an insert for a Moore's uh, Share Night fundraiser. Um, there was a mentor of mine who once told me 90% of ministry is stealing other people's good ideas. Um, and so I've talked with Cat News, and uh, we're going to try to start uh, rotating back and forth Moore's Nights between the youth program and the preschool. Uh, and so on Monday, July the 15th, we are going to have a Moore's Barbecue Share Night. So any of the proceeds on that day from 5 to 8, dine-in, drive-through, take-out will go to 10% uh, of that will support the youth ministry. And so hope y'all go, have dinner, take the night off from cooking, and have some good time. The last time I went to the preschool, it was like a little church reunion there. We were everybody visiting and having a grand old time. And yes, I know the zip code is wrong. I made the bulletin. It's an insert. It's my fault. Um, don't go to West Virginia. That's where that zip code is. Uh, a couple of other announcements. Um, and you will have seen the last few weeks in the Centenary Connection um, that there has been a request for help with medical transportation. We have many members of our church family um, who don't have uh, blood relations nearby. Uh, and who the help getting around, help getting to doctor's appointments, physical therapy, or other medical appointments and procedures. If you feel led to uh, offer to help our church family in that regard, please contact the church office. And also, finally, want to lift up the opportunity for greeter training. Um, the... Uh, I was sitting with Van in a meeting not long ago, and I'm going to read his words straight from the, the Friday Centenary Connection. I was recently told that while Centenary is a wonderful place to worship, worship such and such of a church has friendlier people. I know that that isn't true, but if we're truly glad to have new faces, let's show it. If you attend worship at Centenary, you are a greeter. If you see someone that you don't know, please greet them warmly and welcome them home to Centenary. Ask them if you can help in any way. So, we're all breeders. Let's try to be warm and hospitable people in that regard. As always, there's a lot of information in the bulletin, and so if I should please read through that, and I think Paul's got it now that he's going to share with us. On the back of your Let's Go Eat announcement uh, is the next Sunday we will have a patriotic musical celebration since the 4th of July kind of falls almost in the middle between two Sundays. Uh, the Newburn Community Gospel Choir, which this concert will be made up of about 23, 24 of our choir, part of First Baptist, so it, it ended up being over 60 voice choir. So it's at Centenary now. So if you've gone to the Gospel Choir that's always at First Baptist, it's now at Centenary for next Sunday at 4 o'clock, uh, Patriotic Celebration. You will hear Barry Templeton, uh, director at First Baptist, and myself. We're playing a piano and organ duet for the first time, which will be really fun. Uh, we'll have a brand new group that is in New Bern called the Craven Ukes. It's a ukulele group that will lead you in some fun, old-time baseball game uh, songs. It'll be a wonderful afternoon of music, and it's free. So uh, I uh, invite you to come and have a wonderful afternoon uh, as we celebrate our one nation under God. And can never say enough, thank you so very much for your love and your prayers and your support of the music ministry here at Central. And now friends, having gotten our announcements before all of you, let's prepare our hearts and minds to worship the Lord this day in spirit and in truth.
stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O oh Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Our gospel lesson is from the fifth chapter of Mark. Stand with your people. Sorry about such a short sit down. <laughs> they came to the other side of the sea, to the region of the Genesis. And when he had stepped out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. He lived among the tombs, and no one could restrain him anymore, even with a chain. For he had often been restrained with shackles and chains, but the chains he wrenched apart, and the shackles he broke in pieces. And no one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always howling and bruising himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and bowed down before him, and he shouted at the top of his voice, what have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he had said to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. He begged him earnestly not to send them out of the region. Now there on a the hillside a great herd of swine was feeding, and the unclean spirits begged him, Send us into the swine, let us enter them. Such was the tradition, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the swine. And the herd, numbering about 2,000, stampeded down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned in the sea. The swine herds ran off and told it in the city and in the country. And people came to see what was happening. They came to Jesus and saw the man possessed by demons sitting there, clothed and in his right mind the very man who had had the legion, and they became frightened. Those who had seen what had happened to the man possessed by demons and to the swine reported it. Then they began to beg Jesus to leave their neighborhood. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed by demons begged him that he might be with him. But Jesus refused and said to him, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and what mercy he has shown you. He went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. Everyone was amazed. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. used cloths, right? We have used, you know, 
wet paper towel, all those kinds of things, and yet the glass persists. And um, I was thinking about um, our faith and how it really, you know, this is what pastors do, right? Ooh, can I use this in a sermon? <laughs> so I was thinking that for some people, their faith can be very fragile. Now, I'm sure it's not anyone in here, but when we suffer a trauma or a break of some kind, I've noticed that some people, it increases their faith and they get to know the Lord better. And for others, their faith can develop this fragility. And it seems that, you know, when, as long as everything is going well, we all say this, do we not? As long as everything is going well, we have a tendency maybe not to pray as much as we do when things are not going quite as smoothly or so well. And I became aware of this about how fragile relationships are because um, both of my parents have been gone for years and years and years now. They've gone home to be with the Lord. But in talking to siblings as we continue to grow, and I'm always listening, right? Um, it seems that my parents' divorce continues to affect us even all these years later, even though my dad has been gone now almost 20 years. And, um, and so I was thinking about what, what, how do these life events in the, in the lives of our, in our lives and in the life of our faith communities, how does it affect us? Where are those broken pieces of glass, those shards of glass that um, we can, you know, that can still harm us or wound us, if you will? You know, events that have happened a long time ago, they can be like those sharp pieces of glass. They can be hidden. You don't see them until all of a sudden you feel it underneath your foot, you cut yourself. The story about the demoniac has always, always touched me. There is a lot in this passage, and I was sharing with Steve, I never know where to cut it off. You know, I, I want to hear all of it from the beginning of the passage to the end. I don't, I don't like to do verses or pieces um, of Jesus and the disciples. And Mark's description of him is stark. The demoniac, and I think that's why it touches me so. And and I have not preached on this, so I'm going way out here. So you all just come with me. <laughs> this was something that grabbed hold of me the last two weeks. And on top, uh, in the midst of undergoing some challenges myself, and it would not let me go. So I want us to pay attention to this: that people had tried to restrain and subdue the man, the demoniac, often. Often. Now, usually, what I had done in the past is you read the setup of the passage and then you go to, to a little longer down here. We, the, the swine and Jesus and the disciples and the conversation of backing up that Jesus is having with Legion. And we just kind of skip over those first few verses. And <laughs> those were the verses that wouldn't let me go this week. People had tried to restrain him and subdue him. They had tried to control him. How did he feel about this? About others defining him and trying to control him? Because that is what has happened. He is no longer living with his neighbors. He's restless. He moves from place to place, seeking. He makes noise, a lot of noise. Mark writes, he's howling. And he takes his feelings out on himself. Is he angry? This is the me going way out on the limb here. Is he angry? Do you know angry people in your life right now? It seems like we just have to scroll through our phones, right? <laughs> and see some of the headlines. <clears throat> Where does he find himself? What does he think about his condition? Is how he living common knowledge? Because he's in a graveyard, right? He's among the tombstones. He's not living with others. Stark. And as we continue to read, far off, Jesus approaches. We're like, Thank goodness, Jesus is going to know what to do about this situation. 
and interested in the demoniac runs toward him. Doesn't hide, runs toward Jesus and shouts at him. Now, Legion doesn't hide, and Legion and Jesus are not confused about one another. That's this conversation that unfolds. There is conversation between them before Jesus, Jesus subdues the evil spirits. And I'm using Mark's earlier word. So legion, the unclean spirits, go from the man to the swine, and from the swine into the water. Done. Jesus has gotten rid of them. No longer can this man be defined as a demoniac. He's free. Set free by Jesus. Now, when all of this reaches others, what looks like it should be a time to say <laughs> a praise, right, as we would say, people don't respond well. People do not respond well. It is not the expected response that we are looking for. The unclean spirits are gone. The man is healed. That's wonderful news. And yet they are fearful. And they are suspicious. Because they do not fully understand what has happened. And also, they were not involved. Now, they had removed him from the neighborhood, as Mark writes. But... They were not involved with what unfolded between Legion and Jesus. And in Mark 17, we read that the people literally begged Jesus to leave their neighborhood. Oh, <laughs> that sounds a little bit like we'd say, my church my town right? instead of our church the lord's church our church our community our town you see the difference get out jesus <laughs> we don't understand what you're doing but we know that we are not in control and we don't like it we will decide what happens not you what does and does not happen and we can only tolerate so much. Have you ever said that in your life before? We can only tolerate so much. I can't handle one more thing. Because, see, they thought they had taken care of the problem. And now this is just riled everything all up again. Hmm. Fuzzy. Sometimes there's some fuzziness about what is happening around us and with our loved ones. You know, bad things, good things happen. Life is, we say life is fragile, do we not? Faith can be fragile too. And fragility can blind us to what it is that's happening all around us. If Jesus leaves, which he does, if Jesus leaves, they get to go back to the way life was before. He's not a threat anymore. He's not upending how they think about things and how they look at others. Except for the fact that the man is no longer the same. Right? Because the unclean spirits, the demons, what did Jesus do again? Into the swine, and the swine into the water. A healing. A celebration. And yet people are suspicious. And the man, though, as we can expect, it changes him. He's now going to go out and tell others about what Jesus has done for him, as Jesus instructs him to do. So he's also obedient. And now a disciple. And eager to tell others about what Jesus has done. So I was thinking a lot about how do we get to a point, as people of faith, 
or as a faith community, or maybe we will just say as individuals, when we kind of um, can't celebrate some of the good things going on in our churches and our communities. Because we want to be able to encourage, I mean, to encourage one another almost every Sunday, not all Sundays, but a lot of Sundays I stand down there and say, joys and concerns, we want to celebrate and encourage one another, celebrate with you, lift up the praises, amen, so we can all celebrate together. And then for the concerns, we want to know who and what is on your heart so that we can be in prayer for one another. As the body, corporately, communally, this is our, these are our people right here, right? Our community, our church, but also outside of the walls of the church. So I was thinking of those people. I've always been fascinated and I cannot remember every single story that I've told in here so far because I don't always write everything down. But, <laughs> but I've always been fascinating about the most senior folks that I've had the blessing to meet. In, in doing what Pastor Tyler and Pastor Dan and I do um, in any kind of circumstance, whether it's somehow church-related, community-related, you're just talking to somebody in line somewhere in a waiting room. And there's one woman, I think I've talked about her, I used her as an example, but I'm going to lift her up again, who I met, that, whom I met, that was 100 years old, and her favorite place was to sit in a rocking chair on the front porch of their farm, of their land, in her on her in her front porch of her house, and it didn't fail that whenever I drove by, she had the Bible open on her lap. She was also sitting outside. She was not inside in the air conditioner, which is one of my favorite places to be. <laughs> but, but what a witness, right? Two lane, out in the fields of eastern North Carolina. Um, near a couple of intersections that don't have any signage. If you do not know where you are going, you are not, you just, you may not get to where you want to be, <laughs> despite those little devices that we carry in our pocket. Um, but what a witness to everybody that went by all day long, right? She'd sit out there and read her Bible. And because that was her focus, her faith was rock solid. Strong woman of faith. She could talk to you about anything, ask you questions to challenge the intern. <laughs> but she didn't ask too many questions. She was always pouring into the people that were around her with this, with this, and a word to Jesus. And her favorite passages, if you will, from the Bible. And she might start out with Old Testament, but usually it got to a gospel <coughs> or one of Paul's letters. Not a fragile faith. So now, what have I been wrestling with the last few weeks? I will just be confessional up here. A lot of things about boundaries and expectations. Have you ever had seasons like that? Maybe not about yourself, but just with things going on around you, you're trying to work out, okay, God, what is it, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? What is it you want me to say? Where do you want me to go? Have we not all had something happen in our lives or the lives of a loved one where we have wondered the exact same thing? We are getting ready in a few days to go up and see our youngest and her husband who's come through those several months of his health challenges and now seems to be doing so much better, but we don't want to take their word for it. <laughs> We're going to go up, hug their necks, spend some time with them, eat with them, tell them in person that we love them. And we're reminded of how we're all connected, right? By the blood of Jesus. So think of those moments maybe in your own life where things seem to live a little tenuous due to unforeseen circumstances and experiences. I mean, these folks, we can't be too harsh. <laughs> we can't be too harsh with the folks here. Because they didn't know that Jesus was coming that day. Right? They didn't know. They didn't know that all of this was going to happen, unfold. I'm sure it didn't happen in just an instant. Right? And he 
the, the man, if the healed man, had had time to go and tell other people, well, the swineherds went and told other people first, then they came to Jesus to see what it was that had happened. And then the healed man is going to everybody else to tell them what happened with the couples. That's how it happens. It still happens like that today. How many times do we meet up here for a meeting or a Bible study or Sunday school or maybe just right out here on Sunday morning or any time during the week and we'll share something like, you never believe what just happened to me or what happened to me this week or where I saw God move. Holy Spirit touching me. It could have only been the Lord. We say that to one another. And then here's the thing, the only little thing, the only little thing that worries me is that sometimes right now we speak with such certainty in our culture, in our churches, in our lives. And when I hear certain phrases sometimes, I'm like, Phew. I wince a little bit and say, are we making sure that we're making space or room for the Lord to move? In that situation, to change some person that we're talking about. And I've heard myself say the last few weeks that I am very conflicted, I am very conflicted, I am very conflicted about something keeps popping up over and over again. And I was thinking the other day, okay, you said that a number of times, Carol. What is it <laughs> that you are conflicted about exactly, <laughs> right? And this is it. This is why I chose this passage today. It's because I keep hearing this finality that as people of faith, we should never have. We are certain of Jesus, right? Our risen Lord, our Lord and Savior. And how Jesus is moving in our communities and in our churches and in our lives. We don't always want to be so certain that we turn out to be like the people here that can't be surprised by what it is that Jesus does. And also we don't want to grow, second we thing, we don't want to grow suspicious of what it is that he's doing. We don't control the Lord any more than we have control. We might have control over our decisions that we make. But our life belongs to the Lord. Amen? And we want to leave space for him to move. So in this text, there are so many things happening at once. We've got Jesus, demons, Boundaries, expectations of ourselves, others, Jesus, unexpected discipleship from the one that others deemed useless, hopeless, out of control. And then issues about power and control. And then we're back to Jesus. Here's what I want us to take away, because the passage was extra long. I was not, I was not going to stand up here for a long time today. I want us to take away what, just what I've been sharing. We can never underestimate what Jesus is going to do in any, and notice present tense, because sometimes I'll hear people use past tense. Nope, nope, risen Savior, risen Lord, Jesus. What Jesus can do in any situation, with any person, within any community, at any time, any place. Can we all affirm that? Yes, yes, say amen. 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 Never underestimate what Jesus can do and remain open to what, he, what it is that he's doing. Don't close ourselves off to it. Remain open. It is simple, simple. And yet, as the Lord's disciples, I think sometimes we struggle with this. So I want to encourage us, encourage us, to look for those among us that are in need of encouraging word, or prayer, or a simple touch, right? Big hand, 
So when you're thinking about them, mm -hmm. pray with them, walk alongside of them. Amen. Always, always, always be open to what it is that Jesus is doing. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads. <clears throat> Gracious and loving God, sometimes we get so caught up in the busyness of our lives. We have so much information at our fingertips that we lose the ability to recognize you in our midst, to see how it is that you are moving among us and healing the broken and the sharp places, drawing us together, and most of us, most of all, drawing us to you. We pray that in the coming days, you would open our hearts <coughs> to the hurting people around us and that you may be the one that leads them to you. Amen. <clears throat>
Yes, ma'am. I've got one that's a general one. It's for the homeless. I see them walking out, and it's just, I don't know, I just want to come to lift them up. So. The homeless? The homeless. Did I see a hand in the choir? Oh, Susan, you see you're hiding behind that column. I can't see you. Yeah, I knew you were going to be here, so I just <laughs> Craig Hatchett, recovering from his heart procedure on Friday. Craig Hatchett, recovering from heart procedure on Friday. Um, are there any others? Then I'm going to lift two more and then we're going to go to God in prayer. Um, this week, Mallory's, my wife Mallory's uncle uh, passed away unexpectedly on Wednesday. His memorial service was yesterday, so if you keep the Watson family uh, in your prayers. And also, um, I spent the first seven years of my ministry in rural churches where farming was still very much an integral part 
uh, the life and rhythm of those communities. And as we drove back and forth between Farborough and uh, Newburn, uh, we're given a vivid reminder of how badly we need rain in eastern North Carolina. So especially we pray for our farmers and those that are dependent on our environment for their living and sustenance. And we pray for some rain to bring some relief this week. Let us continue this prayerful time by going to God in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, there are so many people in our midst and in our world who are in pain this day. By your Spirit, may you help us to prevent that suffering and pain where we can, that we might show your love for all creation. Equip us by your strength to care for all those who suffer. And God, just as there are people in our midst who are in pain, there are people around us who have experienced hurt, grief, brokenness, and sorrow. May you help us to recognize when we are a part of what brings pain, grief, and brokenness to others. And when we make that realization, equip us to overcome it. Help us to act in loving ways towards our neighbors, be they strangers or friends, be they loved ones or enemies. Help us to love others as ourselves. Help us to love others as you love us. God, just as there are people around us who are in pain and experiencing hurt, there are people in our midst and in our community who are silent victims of unspeakable pain and tragedy who are unable to bring about healing for themselves and for those they love. Bring them sustenance and help us to speak the truth of love and humility. Give us the strength to advocate for justice for those who are unable to speak for themselves. Guide us as we seek ways to bring healing for others in a world filled with sickness and destruction. Sustain us, O oh God, with your love and bless us with your hope times when we feel the job that you are calling us to do is too big and that the work you're calling us to is never done. Almighty God, we offer these prayers and the many prayers we offer in the silence of our hearts in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit as one God, both now and forever. Amen. And now, friends, with the confidence of our children, let us pray together the prayer that Jesus teaches us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now as we prepare to offer ourselves and our gifts to God this morning, let us pray. Gracious God, we pray that you would accept our gifts, both the gifts we place in the offering plate and the gifts of our lives to be used for your service and the building of your kingdom. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
And now, friends, having offered ourselves and our gifts to God, let's take a moment to offer gifts of uh, friendship and signs of friendship one another as we pass the peace of Christ. <laughs> always with you. As you make your way back to your seats, I invite you to turn in your hymnals to page number 357 for our closing hymns, Just As I Am Without One Plea. <laughs> going to be 
shown by God's grace. And maybe we be equipped to respond by God's grace to those surprises. And may we go forth into the world with the blessings of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in our hearts and minds, both now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs> Thank you.